The last category of threats to internal validity is a bit of a remainder category. Very generally, the three types of threats in this category are related to the research procedure or setup. The threats are ambiguous temporal precedence, history, and mortality. An ambiguous temporal precedence in the hypothesized causal relation is just a fancy way of saying that it's unclear if the hypothesized cause actually precedes the observed effect. Suppose I'm interested in the relationship between playing violent video games and aggressive behavior. I ask high school students how many hours a week they play violent games, and I ask their teacher to rate their aggressiveness in class. What if I find a strong relation? Children who play violent games for many hours a week also show more aggressive behavior. Well, this doesn't mean violent gameplay causes aggressive behavior. Maybe children who play more violent games were more aggressive to begin with, and are more likely to seek out violent stimuli. The threat of ambiguous temporal precedence can be eliminated by manipulating or introducing the hypothesized cause. Of course, not all constructs can be manipulated. But if I can manipulate the cause, I can make sure it happens before the effect. For example, I can make all children play violent games. If children that were not aggressive to begin with also become more aggressive after playing the violent game, then my causal inference is much stronger. Let's move on to a threat referred to as history. A history effect is an unforeseen event that happens during the study that provides an alternative explanation. Now, this could be a large-scale event or something small that goes wrong during data collection. Consider a study on mitigating negative stereotypes about a minority group. The manipulation consists of a group discussion led by an experimenter. The experimenter focuses on the point of view of the minority group, asking participants to put themselves in their shoes. In the control condition, the experimenter focuses on differences between the majority and minority, and stresses the point of view of the majority. In both groups, there are three weekly group discussions. Okay, to give an example of a history effect on a small scale, imagine that during the last session in the control group, the experimenter faints. Of course, participants are shaken and upset about this. And this might translate into a more general negative attitude in the control group which also makes the control group's attitude towards the minority group more negative. The treatment might look effective, because the experimental group is more positive, but the difference is due not to the discussion technique, but due to the fainting incident. Let's consider the history effect on a larger scale. Suppose that during the study, a horrific murder is committed, allegedly by a member of the minority. The crime gets an enormous amount of media attention, reinforcing the negative stereotype about the minority group. Any positive effect of the intervention could be undone by this event. The threat of history is hard to eliminate. Large-scale events, well, they can't be avoided. Small-scale events that happen during the study can be avoided, at least to some extent, by testing subjects separately, if this is possible. This way, if something goes wrong, the results of only one or maybe a few subjects will have to be discarded. The final threat to discuss is mortality. Mortality refers to participant dropout from the study. If groups are compared and dropout is different in these groups, then this could provide an alternative explanation. For example, suppose we're investigating the effectiveness of a drug for depression. Suppose the drug is actually not very effective, and has a very strong side effect. It causes extreme flatulence. Of course, this can be so uncomfortable and embarrassing that it wouldn't be strange for people to drop out of the study because of this side effect. Suppose 80% of people in the experimental group dropped out. In the control group, participants are administered a placebo with no active ingredient, so also no side effects. Dropout in this group is only 10%. It's obvious that the groups are no longer comparable. Suppose that for the remaining 20% of participants in the experimental group, the drug is effective enough to outweigh the negative side effect. This wasn't the case for the 80% who dropped out. Based on the remaining subjects, we might conclude that the drug is very effective. But if all subjects had remained in the study, the conclusion would have been very different. 
The threat of mortality is very hard to eliminate. In most cases, the best a researcher can do is document the reasons for dropout, so that these reasons can be investigated and possibly mitigated in further studies.